Hey there, creatives. I'm excited to bring another bonus episode of the Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit series to you today. Uh, this episode, I am speaking with Kathleen Horn and Tamara Teeter Knapp, uh, who are expressive arts therapists, and they own and operate Expressive Arts Florida which is just north of me in the Sarasota area. And I've been following them for years, um, mostly because in where I live, there's just so few businesses that are focused on the expressive arts that when I learned about what they were doing, I was immediately interested um, and really was looking at, oh, they have you know, great speakers coming into town. Unfortunately, I was never able to go up, but um, I also knew that they were providing an opportunity for folks to learn how to do this work in uh, a format that allows somebody to obtain the registered expressive arts therapy credential through the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association, which I think um, is a really amazing opportunity because people want to know how to do this work or like what the educational requirements are often. And a lot of times it feels inaccessible. And this was really accessible because it's so close by. Um, anyway, they are going to be presenting at the upcoming virtual Expressive Therapy Summit. Um, on November 16th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And they're going to be talking about cultivating self-compassion through their expressive arts practice. You can join in from wherever you are in the world because it's going to be virtual. And honestly, it sounds like an amazing opportunity to feed yourself, to feed your soul, to engage in uh, meaningful creative practice that taps into your creative flow and inner wisdom. And I hope that you enjoy this conversation that I have with both of them, which really talks about their process. And one of the things that I found so inspiring about their work is how they're so true to their value of um, using the expressive arts as a way of knowing, being, and uh, working in the world. And hopefully you'll hear that kind of come full circle in the conversation. The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm your host, Raina Lombardi, and I'm super excited to welcome um, my next two guests. I'm kind of fangirling uh, a little bit right now. Um, I've known about their work for quite some time, uh, and so I'm so excited to talk with them and and share, um, share their work with you. Uh, so my guests are Kathleen Horn, who is a licensed mental health counselor. She's a registered expressive arts therapist, a registered expressive arts consultant educator, and has been a psychotherapist since 1980 and an expressive therapist since 1996. She has a master's in counseling from University of South Florida and a graduate certificate in expressive 
Arts Therapy from California Institute of Integral Studies. Her training and practice in expressive arts has been life-changing, both per personally and professionally. Kathleen is the co-founder and core faculty of Expressive Arts Florida Institute. And since 2011, she's been training students in the field of expressive arts, as well as offering a wide variety of workshops and community programs. She believes that expressive arts is a wisdom practice and is dedicated to living and sharing the transformational gifts that it offers. She's a visual artist with a lifelong practice and love of creating mandalas. Kathleen divides her time between Sarasota, Florida and Cortez Island, British Columbia. And she has been a board member of AIDA, the International Expressive Arts Therapy Association, since 2007, and is the proud recipient of the AIDA Shining Star Award for 2023. Wow, congratulations, <laughs> Kathleen. That's awesome. And Tamara Knapp who also is a registered expressive arts consultant educator, a mental health counselor intern, and a certified K through 12 art educator with 20 plus years experience educating others through the arts. She's the co-founder and core faculty at Expressive Arts Florida Institute and began her teaching career as a Waldorf teacher in 1997 in Alaska before relocating to Florida where she taught art and elementary education. Tamara continues to value the integration of the arts and education and has been training others in the field of expressive arts for 10 years. Since earning a master's in mental health counseling, she has worked to integrate her extensive experience and knowledge of expressive arts in her clinical work. Tamara continues to develop her interest in body-based intermodal processes that integrate theories of neuroscience and the creative modalities. The focus of her work is to help others discover the healing and transformative power of their own creativity. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> so both of you are going to be teaching at this year's virtual uh, East Coast Expressive Therapy Summit. And you're going to be teaching on the uh, art of self-compassion through expressive arts practice. Can we first start off, um, Kathleen, by talking about what is self-compassion? Mm. Well, that's a great question to begin with. Thank you so much. I um when I think of self-compassion and I think of self-compassion within the context of expressive arts, I think about being a loving witness to ourselves mm -hmm. and bringing that spirit of bearing witness, holding space, to ourselves, to our own inner life, to our struggles, our challenges, our accomplishments, um, to give ourselves the gift of what we as compassionate people and therapists and teachers give so easily and readily to another. Mm. Tamara, anything to add to that definition? Well, I love that phrase. I wrote it down, loving witness. And that's something that um, I think is very true about self-compassion. Um, I know that I look at self-compassion too through the lens of like Kristen Neff, um, which really includes mindfulness, mm -hmm. self-kindness, it's not just about, I mean, compassion in, in, includes kindness, being kind to ourselves and common humanity, right? Connecting these three things. Mm -hmm. So when we um, turn toward something with self-compassion, we connect within ourselves, acknowledging and being kind and um 
and mindful of whatever is that we're that that's tender and when we connect then within ourselves in that way we can also connect to others in that way so there's this um beautiful like loop right mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. and um so it's it's like turning towards something that is needed with kindness and love and um offering that back to ourselves mm. i love that i love that and i i i too love the um phrase loving witness being a loving witness it's often we don't allow ourselves to witness our own process in the same way that we might do for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And yet when we do, it really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could kind of see the loop from within, like your heart space out to the other person's heart space through that process. Um, do either of you have a, your own kind of method or, or ritual, um, with your arts practice that integrates that, uh, regularly? Tamara's shaking her head. Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I do. Um, and that is something I've come to, I've begun to practice, which is when I'm feeling a little bit, and that's really, I think, what this um, kind of teaching or experience will be in the summit about is that when I identify that there for myself, that there's something, like I said, that's feeling tender, that is, um, I'm having some difficulty with, I first, then I, I kind of ask, what is the need? That, that, and what is it that I need? And um, and then I offer that need some compassion in a sense and offer it back to myself. Um, and the way that I often identify what it is I need is through my art practice, right? So something's niggling at me, right? What is going on here? I can't seem to settle or I'm feeling agitated or um, just kind of whatever, I don't know. And um, I create around in, in my practice, maybe create an image or do some movement um, or sound. And it just depends on that, you know, the, the time and uh, what, I'm, what I'm grappling with. And then from that place, then I can um, offer back what it is that I feel meets that need, right? And sort of offer that back to myself. So um, a regular art practice for me is really about that, being present mm -hmm. to what is arriving within me and offering myself um, the compassion that I need, mm -hmm. you know, and then but it does really help to meet the need that's being called, called yeah. calling me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's like some honoring there. There's honoring yes. the space and time to allow yourself to discover what that is and then respond to it, um, in a way that, uh, is meaningful and attends to, what what's happening in that moment um, yeah Kathleen how about you do you have um a, your own method that may be similar maybe different than yeah. Tamara's yes I I do I um you know I've never um I didn't start doing this as a way to cultivate self-compassion but my arts practice certainly does. And, um, you know, picking up on what Tamara said about being present for ourselves. Um, I find what I, my, what I do mostly in my 
expressive arts practice is I just make it a habit to come to my space, to sit down, to take a few moments to connect with the earth and connect with my heart and connect with that, what I call ever present, ever abundant creative flow. Remember that it's there. Remember that it's wise and open my heart to that and then just it usually open my journal sketchbook and um make an image it's usually not anything that i recognize from the outer world it's colors and shapes on the paper and usually a mystery but I don't try to figure it out. I give it a voice then. So sometimes I'll move to it, take the energy in, move my body, often without even getting up out of my chair. Mm. And then I'll write. And I usually write from the voice of the image. So I start with I am or I know. And then somehow my image speaks and I just write down whatever it says. And what happens for me is that through that practice, I am staying connected with myself, right? I am staying current with what's going on inside of me. Mm -hmm. And when I don't do that, when I feel like I'm too busy or I'm too this or I'm too that, and I find myself moving away from that practice, that's when things start to build up internally that I feel like I need to really consciously pay attention to, right? Mm. Yes. Yeah. A lot of wisdom that you just shared there. It's so mm -hmm. easy to for us in our current society, how fast paced things are to fall victim to that uh, like, I don't have ah. time to take care of me. I don't have time to carve out the yeah. space to take care of my needs, um, which I think there is yes. a need. There is an inherent need for all of us to express ourselves creatively. Um, yes, I, I believe that. Um, so when we don't give ourselves, you're right. We don't give ourselves that time. It it hurts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, it's sort of like Tamara was talking about that loop, right? And we can't leave ourselves out of that loop, right? We have to nourish and feed ourselves. And I don't expect it's this way for everybody. But for me, it's through my creative practice that really feeds, mm -hmm. feeds that need for being um aware and mindful and a witness to myself mm -hmm. yeah yeah it also sounds like not just being that witness to yourself but it's also about refueling yourself and making mm -hmm. sure that you have the energy resources to be able to extend from your heart to other yes. people that you're helping and yes um being with yes absolutely yeah so what are you going to be doing in the three-hour workshop with attendees that go to uh, the summit um, and participate in the self-compassion training that you're offering there? Well, um, we will be doing a very, it will be a very exp experiential mm -hmm. um, process that we'll offer that will be simple, a simple expressive arts process, but 
again, really with that focus of how do we turn towards something that is a need and offer self-compassion um, to meet that need. So in expressive arts, we use all the many different arts modalities, not necessarily all of them every time, but in the experience, we will um, guide very, very, you know, carefully and gently guide everyone through a process that will include several different arts modalities mm -hmm. to identify a need that they have. They will just kind of, it's like a, just a practice they'll be able to repeat again, right? So in that moment, so focusing on the moment and some need that might, might be present in that moment, um, how to identify that, express that, and then offer that, um, offer some self-compassion around that. And then one of the things that's very powerful in the whole process, I think, is the witnessing piece Kathleen mm -hmm. was just speaking mm -hmm. about. So it, we always, we have um, basically a five-step approach in the way that we work. And one of the parts of that is distinct and that is witnessing and that's really the piece um so we'll, so that will be part of the process as well and i think by offering self-compassion to ourselves in the process we'll be able and then and then witnessing one another we'll actually be able to receive that that mm -hmm. sense of feeling seen and heard by ourselves mm -hmm and one another and so um so it'll be an interactive you know experiential um process that'll be something that they can do again and again for themselves and also those who are attending will be able to i think pretty easily translate to their you know to the clients they're working with or other implications yeah too mm -hmm. yeah Kathleen, for folks that are listening, that maybe they identify as a, their their modality is music, they do music therapy, or maybe they're a drama therapist, but they haven't had exposure to the intermodal process. Yeah. Would you mind sharing how that differs from, say, um, just distinctly another creative uh, or expressive arts? therapy approach. I know I'm familiar because that's, I went to Leslie and, yeah. <laughs> and that's their, that's their thing. And I, I yes. love it, but for listeners that maybe aren't as familiar. Sure. That's just such a, that's such an important question. And it's a big question. And I, I, I guess I, what I'll try to do is I'll try to answer it in a um, concise way. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think that um, in intermodal or multimodal, two phrases that are often used interchangeably, although we think there are distinctions between them, in intermodal work, um, it's, it's kind of like where the power is, is in um, what we sometimes refer to as a, that thread of creative expression that moves through different modalities if we learn how to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really, um, as a practitioner or a therapist, we have to have familiarity with all of the modalities. We have to be able to kind of traverse that area, the, all the areas, but we do not have to be experts in all the modalities. And truth be told, most expressive arts therapists and pr practitioners, ha we have modalities that are most natural to us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm very grounded in visual art and in writing, and Tamara is really grounded in movement and visual art. And we're, you know, so we have our places of maybe beginning and returning to, you know, but we also have that enough familiarity to be able to follow that thread and to see in an, in a person that we're working with, mm. what is their modality, you know, mm. the, just their language might 
show that they're a very auditory person or they might be using their hands a lot and so they're already moving and showing us that movement might be a really good place to start right mm -hmm. they might be like I'm always like looking up when I'm thinking like I'm looking up when I'm thinking and I'm very visual right I'm also very kinesthetic so it's sort of um becoming attuned to how that thread of creativity moves through myself and anyone that I'm working with, how it moves through a group, right? And yeah. that, so we become attuned to what sort of invitations to offer as places to start. And then each, you know, we watch children Mm -hmm. they don't distinguish right they they're dancing around while they're mm -hmm. telling a story you know or they're singing yeah. while they're painting and you know that's but we forgot that you know because in our culture the arts are have been divided up right and mm -hmm. um and that's fine it's not there's anything wrong with that but this is kind of reclaiming that thread of creativity that we can follow and as we follow it we follow it into different parts of ourselves through different modalities we follow it into our emotional body we follow it into our physical body we express it through movement or through rhythm or through voice and then we reflect on it through mm -hmm. writing you know I mean it's a I'm not sure what else to say. I think that I think maybe I said enough. Maybe you have something to add, Tamara. I, yeah. yeah. I think you said it pretty well. Yeah. So we just follow from shift from one modality to the next and just stay with, yeah, you know, what's present. Mm -hmm. And then it feels like when we do that each time we shift, there's an opening, right? And kind of an expansion our awareness, mm -hmm. you know, and really we have as humans, I think so many ways of knowing mm -hmm. um, that, that our, our dominant culture doesn't always encourage or support. Mm -hmm. So it's for me, I find it to be um, as I, you know, see other people and for myself as well, just this like reclaiming of and learning even relearning or remembering perhaps all these different ways of knowing right. how to know my myself and my world and one another and you know I mean sometimes there are things that we really know inside you know we know it but we don't have words for it yeah and there are other ways of expressing those things that we know as well so it's not just ways of knowing but ways of expressing who we mm -hmm. are in the world and really just kind of moving into the fullness of who we are mm. and becoming very whole in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like the process, at least in my experience is deepening. Mm -hmm. It's deepening that sense of knowing that you're yes. describing because we're yes. allowing ourselves to explore it from a different perspective. And mm -hmm. it's like, amplifying it's amplifying mm -hmm. that sense of really getting to know whatever it is um, mm -hmm. because we're giving ourselves permission to play around with it in all of these different ways because yeah. to know something through what it feels like to move our body to express a concept is so different than to know something through what it feels like and looks like to express it in paint or um in yes. clay yeah. and then of course with our words um to give it voice like you were talking about i often um as a supervisor i encourage my supervisees to do that process that giving voice to the image process and a lot of them are like, what are you talking about? Because it is a very, ex, you know, a very expressive therapies um, mm -hmm. technique. 
and, and they're a little resistant at first, but I'm like, please, if you just, if you just let yourself be vulnerable and try it, it it's real magic happens. There's yes. so many gifts that come with that process. It's uh, beautiful. Yeah. It, it is a vulnerable thing to ask, right? It and is. it's also yes. so rewarding, you know, and I think it builds, also builds self-trust in the same time. Right? Oh, I can do this. And as I do it, I can trust that it works and it continues to, you know, I love that you just use the word amplify. I think mm-hmm. that, that um, is very true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So- I think- so many people um, believe this work is about we're going to ask them to make an image or to create a movement or something, and then we're going to talk about what it means, right? Mm. And we don't really do that. You know, we we see our role as um, facilitating the relationship between the artist and the image how can I support you so that you can learn more from the images from the movements from the sounds from the rhythms that you create and that's where the wisdom is it's Mm -hmm. in that it's Mm -hmm. in that relationship and as we move through the modalities it's often the modality that we're the least comfortable with that brings the biggest shift, mm-hmm. you know, Don't not you. always, but, but often that's the case. So really being able to, um, you know, create safety around helping people just take those gentle risks to move into something that, yes, it's going to feel a little weird at first, But movement doesn't have to be covering the whole room. It can be as simple as moving your hands and you'll still Mm -hmm. derive um, something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you made note of that, that it's often in those most vulnerable places where really um, transformational information comes to the surface. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to shift gears a little bit and kind of go into how the two of you came to found Expressive Arts Florida and share and teach others how to do this work because it is such a unique um program uh, that you don't see very often. Um, Tamara, would you Mm -hmm. mind sharing a little bit? Uh, No, I don't mind. It's such a wonderful question. Um, And such a long story that I'll try to make very short. (laughs) Um, I would like to say that um, I, Kathleen actually is the one who, as you heard in her bio, right, that she received her training at CIIS and then she came back to Sarasota and she kind of held the, the, the solo little candle, you know, light (laughs) of expressive arts here. And I came to Florida in 2000 thinking I had left it behind where I was and I wasn't going to stay long. And I inadvertently met her. And I also met um, Victoria, who was one of the other co-founders in our business in in 2001. And then um, they started a program and I got my certificate from them. And then there was someone who got their certificate with me in that program, Elizabeth. And then the four of us said, hey, we should um, start our own business. And so we started a business in 2007 mostly doing um, contracts in the community and different works, different work like that. And I was teaching full-time as an um, expressive arts teacher, actually, in the the school system. So we continued for a few years. Um, We had a studio and a gallery, and we had uh, community contracts. 
And then it became clear to the four of us at the time that we really, um, we really needed something, something was shifting. And in fact, um, and, and so what we did, and this is what we always did when we developed our business and when we were, when we formed our business, we always made art together. Mm. Okay. So our business is based on that. And so we got together, we made this um, mandala together. Right? These We were affectionately call it pie pieces where each of us had a section. <laughs> and the the very funny thing is that I went down to the storage unit to find the microphone today. I'm going to tell you this right now. And you know what I pulled out of there, Kathleen? Pie pieces. Pie, pie pieces. I have them. I have them here somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. funny that you asked this question. <laughs> so the four of us, we, so we had this thing. And what we did is through our art process, really, it showed us that what we needed was to um, in some way open up things and provide space for others to come in mm -hmm. and learn more so that all having said all of that led to us developing um a training program which we started in january of 2011 and um we haven't stopped since <laughs> basically um because at least the way I feel, and I think I speak for Kathleen as well, but um, we just feel like this work is so needed in the world. And we can't, couldn't do it all by ourselves, right? Yeah. And so over the, over time, um, the partnership of four, you know, was three and now, and then became two. And, and so now it's just Kathleen and I, but the beginning of that was really the four of us deciding that we really need to, um, you know, disseminate this work right out into the world um, in a much bigger way. So we started teaching others and it's been extremely um, wonderfully rewarding, I guess is how I feel about it. So since 2011, we've had a certificate training program. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I and see. I add a couple of small things to that. Yes. I just loved hearing you say that, Tamara. And I was really glad that um, that you you got that question, not me. <laughs> but I um, I think the the thing that I want to emphasize is what you touched on that our our business and our training program was built through the arts. Mm -hmm. And even before the four of us decided to create a business, there were a few more of us. I think there were six people in the beginning that we were all just getting together every week. And we would sit around this little table in this little tiny studio that we had. And we would just make art together. Like, And, and mm -hmm. we'd do different kinds of arts practices. And we would talk. And we were like, we're being you know, kind of called together and something is is emerging out of this and we don't know what it is yet. And we have continued to follow that, um, if you can call that a model, follow that model throughout the entire creation and evolution of this business. And, um, and working out the questions and challenges as they come up through mm -hmm. the arts, usually through some collaborative art making. Yeah. I love that. That that's such a beautiful thing to share, I think, with others that business development doesn't have to be just, you know, spreadsheets and uh business plans that connecting through the artistic process and exploring what's working, what's not working, what do we want to do differently here is possible that there is a business practice that can incorporate the arts in that way. Yes. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I, I would yes. just like to add that it's far more effective than sometimes than trying to think your way through out of it right and you know yeah that consulting your arts practice 
when there are challenges or when there's any uncertainty um, or to embolden a certainty, like whatever, I mean, for whatever reason, really, <laughs> um, seems it it is just, um, again, goes back to that ways of knowing, right? We have within us all that it is that we need in order to move ourselves forward as a business, as an individual, as a group, as a collective, as a, you know, as a planet, mm -hmm. right? I believe we have that mm -hmm. in, within us. And so the arts provide a way for us to consult the wisdom that we share and to bring it forward and to form. I love that. That's wonderful um, and important, important for people to hear. I think, you know, as practitioners, we we have a sense of knowing about that that's different mm -hmm. because of our immersion in it and and all of the witnessing that we do in seeing others find wisdom in their art making process. Um, but for folks that might not might be in the mental health field, but they're not really exposed to, the arts process in therapy and, and how it differs, um, or I think what you said is very helpful, um, mm -hmm. right? Like, Hey, <laughs> that there's a lot more happening here than this is we're making art and that's an enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's yes. real oh, deep yeah. work, um, excavation that's happening yes. Uh, yes. through the process um, and I think that's what you're yes. really speaking to that that wisdom mm -hmm. I think excavation and cultivation mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and um you know we kind of somehow this term came to us creative wisdom and I think it's I think that term that came because for me anyway I didn't feel like I had a word to refer to that um, kind of stream of inner wisdom that comes when we trust our creativity mm. mm -hmm. yeah trusting Trusting the process is something that mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we learn pretty early on. And yes. as, as we're learning this work, which is trust mm -hmm. the process, um, you know, learn, you learn to trust in your creative process and that mm -hmm. it really does have um, a lot of rich material for you uh, to learn from. How does one go about setting up a certificate program which allows people to learn all the things that they would typically learn in a graduate program. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's so unique about what the way that you're teaching, right? There's plenty of practices like mine where it might offer continuing education training, but but that's not just what you're doing. You have a curriculum that people follow. They are working with you for a long time. They're having a, di a, a deep, rich, immersive experience. Um, yes. How, how mm -hmm. did, how, what goes into that? <laughs> oh it's, gosh. I, it, it's such an interesting, that's so interesting that you asked that because honestly, once we decided that that's what we were going to do, we just started writing the curriculum and mm -hmm. um, putting things in place and learning as we went, you know, what, what do you have to set up? What do you have to like, what kind of structure do we have? What, all, you know, I, it does seem like a big task when you <laughs> ask the question that way. And it was, but mm -hmm. honestly, um, I don't think we ever really looked back or questioned it once we made the decision. And, you know, we're very involved with the 
International Express Parts Therapy Association, IATA. And so we've been attuned all along the way to the requirements for professional registration, both for registered expressive arts therapists and registered expressive arts consultant educators. And um, so we knew that it was going to be important to create a program that would meet those requirements, right? Mm. That would give people the essential training in expressive arts that would um, allow them to pursue registration, either as a REIT or as a RIS, depending on um, the pathway that they were on. So mm -hmm. we're not in our program, we don't teach the therapy part, we teach expressive arts. Mm -hmm. And so the people that come through our program and are going on to become REITs, um, they already have either already have their therapy training or they're getting it concurrently with our program, right? So um, I think what we've done in our program that is pretty unique, actually, is that we have defined and refined um, the essential components of expressive arts and expressive arts is at the center and how expressive arts is applied is limitless right mm -hmm. and so it can be integrated with profession of spiritual direction it can be integrated with the profession of psychotherapy with social work with um with you know, hospice, end of life care with business, it just kind of goes on and on. And um, I think that perspective of putting expressive arts at the center, mm -hmm. and really defining and teaching what it is, and how it can be applied. And, you know, over the years of teaching this, we've really developed our own approach, which at the beginning we had it, but we couldn't really articulate it. But now it's, you know, we do have a defined Expressive Arts Florida approach to this work. Mm. Thank you for I, sharing that. I wouldn't, I'd like to add a little bit to that if I may. And that is that um, I think, you know, like Kathleen said, we identified the, the competencies like the things mm -hmm. that you know needed to be learned in order to practice this work in whatever setting we needed um, one wanted to and then we um set to work to develop the curriculum in a way that um not only helped people to um develop those competencies but to really experience the work um from the inside out so we do have i mean our program is very experiential um it's what i would call a transformational learning model which is that our students come to us and they do the work mm -hmm. and then they reflect on the work and through the whole process they are transformed <laughs> and it's um so it is a deep dive um and it's also a supported process. So our students receive monthly mentoring um, and the clinicians do um, a course called supervised clinical practicum. So they're all of the, if they're, if they're learning to be facilitators, they're mentored by facilitators. If they're learning to be, um, you know, if they're, if they're a clinician then they're, they're mentored by a clinician, right? So there's an individualized component to the program as well. And built into the program are, um, hours that they need to do on their own. We call them electives. They can do them with us or they can do them elsewhere to also individualize the program. But all of that is said so that they are set up so that um, our students um, get what they uniquely need mm -hmm. in order to develop their own expression of this work in the world. And that's, that is, I think, um, a really important part of of um, 
our kind of mission, right? Because yeah. I, we really want our students' um, experience to be valued. Like this is one of those professions where life experience is fully you know, valued, right? You, the, it's almost like the more life experience you have, the better, right? Because you, it's like becomes um, part of, you know, what you're able to empathize with, you know, what you're able to um, imagine as possibilities. And um, so we, we really do spend time to help them to do that. But each of our core courses then are, they're kind of looked at, it looks at expressive arts through a different lens, so to speak. Um, and we try to really, um, give them a full experience of, of what expressive arts is and then, um, ways for them to uh, incorporate that into who they are. Our mm -hmm. students embody the work is what happens. They embody the work. There's no way they can't share it, right? <laughs> because they just, <laughs> like coming out, they, it's just part of them. And that's another piece of it is that we, um, firmly believe that you have to be practicing this work. Mm -hmm. So personal practice is something that's um, an element in the program. And we have to practice it in order to share it with someone else. Right. Yeah. And so that's another cornerstone, I think, of the program mm -hmm. is the personal practice piece. And, um, and then the reflection piece, we teach them how to reflect on their experiences using expressive arts. They get it in all kinds of ways, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that, you know, you're highlighting that it is such an experiential process because as we were talking about before, pertaining to knowing, yeah, the experience helps to concretize that knowing within. And that's a different sense of knowing than I read a paper about it, or I read a book about this approach, but spending time immersed, doing, playing, reflecting, doing again and reflecting again, and kind of moving through that process that creates a different sense of knowing that as mm -hmm. a practitioner, you, I think, develop uh, greater flexibility of response with the clients that you're working with because of that knowledge, right? And you're, you're using mm -hmm. that term like embodied, right? They're so mm -hmm. embodied because of it, um, mm -hmm. that, that that's, that's helping them in their role. I, I think I'd like to say that we've had quite a few students um, enroll in our program who um, they state their intention as I'm going to learn some new tools to use with my clients. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that's good. You know, yeah. we're always like, we always say that's going to happen. It's great. And you're also going to go on a personal journey just so that you know that. And um, I, I can just like remember one particular student who at the end of like maybe her second intensive, she's like, oh, I get it. It's about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and it's about your clients, but it has to be about you because it's like that circle that we talked about, that loop at the beginning. Like mm -hmm. you have to be, we have to be embodying this in order to share it. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that that you know, you were talking about the thread of the yeah. intermodal process, but I really hear that that thread is through everything that the two of you are doing. Every person that you're working with, every student, every part of how you operate your business, that thread is there. Mm -hmm. That's a lovely way to reflect it back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. How long does it take for somebody to go through um, your program for them to then be able to 
start their practicing work to work towards the credential. Cause obviously mm -hmm. just like with our other credentials, the read, if your people aren't familiar with it requires clinical practice and supervision mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Um, well, oh. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> um, it's the length of time that students spend in our program is actually flexible, right? Um, because we have a, I guess you would call it a rolling entry, like each time we offer a level one course, mm -hmm. new students can enter, right? So they don't have to wait till the whole new cohort starts. And, um, and then as our courses come up, students can take anything that they're eligible for, but they can also slow it down if they want to for any reason, because of resources, because of schedule, you know, it because of yeah. travel, whatever it is. So um, we have some students who are finishing all the core courses in a year. And um, we have some who are taking two years, I'd say, I don't know, what do you think, Tamara, now, since we've gone online, maybe a year and a half to two years would be sort of average. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And still, um, if you're, if a student is um, not a clinician, but a facilitator, and they're going to be, um, you know, pursuing like the Reese, for instance, um, they do an internship, right? So they'll do all the core courses and they still do internship. The others do and those are offered when we have like those are offered all the time they're offered you know once or twice a year kind of thing so so yeah it's typically like um one and a half two years maybe something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we had one student do it in like a year I don't even know yeah. how she did it but <laughs> she did a great job um <laughs> you know but it, that's also very fast I think that um Part of one of the factors is the on um, how, how long it takes is the individual's capacity to assimilate all of the information, not just information, but experiences, you know, that they're having because it's um, it really is an integration process. Right. So if they're a busy mom and they're, you know, working, you know, it, it might take longer, yeah. but if they're, mm -hmm. you know, um, single and don't have children at home or they're, you know, whatever, whatever the circumstances are in their lives might, might allow for more time because there are assignments and readings and, you know, along with the courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Um, I think a that, long answer. <laughs> that's okay. I, I think it's a, a great answer. And I know it's one that I'm going to direct people to listen to this episode when they are curious about this work and they already have a master's degree, but they are really passionate about the arts and really want to integrate it into their work, but they don't necessarily want to move out of state to go to, you know, another program um, so that they can hear what you offer, um, which is so valuable and it is important. And like you were saying, there, there, are, there is not enough people doing this work, which really helps people connect to what it means to be human. And, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I think in our profession, in the therapy profession, we get away from that, but the arts help us stay connected to that piece. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I so agree. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, for folks that want to learn more about your program, what you do, where can they find you what would be the best way to find you um probably on our website at um expressivartsflorida.com be the easiest thing yeah yeah mm -hmm. i will definitely put that in the show notes and i'm also going to put a link to your expressive therapy summit session in the show notes, which anybody can attend from anywhere because it's virtual yeah. over zoom. And it sounds like it's going to be a beautiful gift to oneself 
uh, mm. to anyone who attends. Yeah. Um, and I am so grateful for both of you making the time to talk with me today about your work and what you're going to be teaching at the summit. Thank you so much, Raina. I am very appreciative and just so touched that we were able to do this. It's been wonderful to yes. talk with you. I agree. I'm, I feel, um, I, I feel honored by the, by the interest and the questions that you've asked and the way that you've reflected back to us. Um, it's been a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I hope you enjoyed this uh, edition of the Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit. Um, definitely check out uh, Kathleen and Tamara's session on November 16th on the um, East Coast Virtual Expressive Therapy Summit um, event. There's going to be plenty of other opportunities to learn from other amazing clinicians there as well. Um, I'm also going to be teaching at the summit this year. Um, Kathleen and Tamara are, are going to be teaching on cultivating self-compassion through expressive arts practice. So that means it's an opportunity for you to connect with yourself and um, engage in your own practice while learning how to facilitate this approach that they use with others. Um, I, honestly, I think anytime we can have that time to replenish and renourish ourselves through uh, the creative arts practice is really important. Um, it just allows us to be present for clients through our own understanding wisdom, ways of knowing uh, that doesn't often translate through just the didactic experience alone. Um, and I hope you kind of gleaned that from our conversation too, how that that is so much a part of the process, maintaining our own practices um, as best we can. And if you can't make it to their workshop at the summit, I highly recommend that you head over to their website, www.expressivetherapysummit.com. You'll be able to find plenty of opportunities to learn from amazing practitioners from around the country and around the world, and many opportunities to learn virtually from wherever you are, um, but still immerse yourself in the creative experience. Uh, they also have opportunities to learn in person. Um, there's the, obviously, the East Coast Summit, which takes place in November. They also have a Midwest uh, Summit taking place in Chicago. They have um, the West Coast Summit, which is California-based. And over the summer, they had uh, programming in um in Arizona, in Sedona, Arizona. And I really wanted to go this year. I learned about it last year, but by the time I learned about it, it was too late. Um, and then I got so wrapped up in everything that was going on, I think with my move, um, that uh, it just didn't happen. By the time I learned about it, it was the dates, it was already happening. But that is definitely on my agenda to attend next year. Um, so if you're looking to expand your learnings uh, to learn from people, maybe outside of your modality, um, the Expressive Therapy Summit is the best place to, uh, to go for that information. And uh, I swear it's one of the best um, training experiences that I've had continuously as a professional over the years. Um, I may be a little biased, but no. Uh, anyways, check out Kathleen and Tamara's uh, session over there. Um, I put the link to the registration page in the show notes, uh, but you can always just head over to www.expressivetherapysummit.com. 
And till next time, keep it creative. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.